All right, YouTube, it's time for another video. Just find another place to sit here, drink a small little protein shake after working out. Did a little bit of a late night dusk drive. And now, here we are, another day of bullshit. I think this video, it's been on my mind a little bit more lately, and I've, I've brought this up a lot in the first uh, couple videos I made, but it's mostly just about the phrase, nobody owes you anything. And, and how much I hate that fucking phrase. And uh, the reason why I hate that phrase more than anything in this world, maybe not, okay, I'm being a little bit over the top there, but it's mostly just because of how Everybody seems to say it to you when it's something that you care about. But as soon as it's something that they care about, we have to stop what they're doing or what we're doing and get on our hands and knees and make sure that they are feeling um, accepted and um, that they are being heard, that they're not being, their voice isn't being erased, etc. And you see everybody from the straight white male to a, you know, LGBT black woman or whatever, and everybody in between seems to think that they are the ones being replaced, they are the ones being left behind, they are the ones who are being erased, um, etc. And... It's almost like everybody feels this way because we kind of are, but at the same time, a large chunk of it is the fault of people in general and how little people go out and do anything. Um, you know, I know so many people nowadays who they only stay indoors, play World of Warcraft for fucking eight hours a day, and then they want to know why their social life sucks. Now, the reason why this got this got um, on my mind was this is actually uh, something, you know, there was an article on, um, I want to say it was Medium, and it was written by a woman who I, I suppose is a lesbian, or at least she's LGBT, and she was uh, fresh, you know, she's fresh out of college, mid, mid, mid to late 20s, and apparently the girl that she dated in college is now with a man, and she felt like her relationship her with her was being erased and and then like projected it as this whole like lesbian erasure uh that was happening because her her girl the girl that she dated in college you know was that stereotypical you know there's a term and I've you know I I saw it with some women that I I know at the in the universities that I went to I went to college and I went to two different ones the term lesbian until graduation and it's you know women I suppose when they're in high school and younger feel trapped in the dating game and then they get this huge branch of freedom because college is when you turn 18 and, and that's a whole nother, you know, that's you're a legal adult for better or for worse. Uh, so I think it might be a little too young these days, but, but, um, but she, she, you know, women, girls, I, I know multiple women who have, have done the whole lesbian until graduation thing. And, they realize, I guess they realized it wasn't for them. Um, and that's fine too. But I do think that this article that was written, and I'm going to try to find it and maybe put it in the description below, but was either A, um, a girl's massive projection, or B, her post-college loneliness that hits all of us. You know, as a, I'm, a, I'm a straight white male who... You know, I, I, I hit that post-college depression of not having that social group. I actually would argue college wasn't even that great. Uh, high school was probably the most social environment I was ever in. But college was pretty good, too, just because my, I, I might have gotten lucky, but at least my freshman and sophomore year, the dorms that I stayed in were very lively, the the, the halls. And, and they weren't co-ed dorms or anything, but, you know girls would come over and guys, you know, we'd go over to the girls dorms. And so we had a, you know, a healthy, semi-healthy, uh, social group with, with both guys and girls. And that all went away by kind of really by late college, really. Once you started more seeing the finish line to the college degree and post-college life, 
Um, you know, people, people think that like, you don't see the, the transition to the end points of a certain era of your life. People think it just like that era abruptly happens. It really doesn't. Um, you know, my, my freshman year of high school felt a lot more different than my senior year. Um, even if I was in still in the same environment, the same thing goes with college. My freshman year of college, I actually started to get a similar feeling to my freshman year of high school, which was this brand new open world type of thing. And then my freshman, and then my, by the time my senior year of college went, uh, hit, um, you know, it, uh, my senior year of college actually felt very similar to my first couple of years outside of college, which was, you know, friend groups were already kind of dwindling. The party was starting to end the metaphorical party or whatever. But anyway, I get off topic. Uh, this girl wrote this detailed essay about just like how she felt like she was being erased because this girl decided to pair up with a guy. First of all, if she, if she decided to date another woman, if she stayed a lesbian or whatever, I mean, that's kind of in saying that, I don't know. Uh, the whole point is if she stayed dating and marrying a woman, would she, st would she not feel erased then? So do, do all lesbian women feel like it's a communal thing? Um, so, but only because she like s switched back to the male team or some shit or team hetero, did she feel erased? And I think that that's really narcissistic. Uh, first of all, one, she's allowed to erase you that way. Um, she doesn't have to stay in your life. She doesn't have to do what you want to do. And, um, she's allowed to move on and say, no, fuck you. That's, that was a phase in my life or whatever. Um, I, I think that, uh, she's, you know, she's very much allowed to do that. Um, and she, you can, you can maybe give some level of props to the author for expressing her thoughts and feelings, but if she's not willing to be criticized for it, I would say that she needs to do a lot more soul searching. Okay. Um, and the same, and then finally, and I think more and more people are seeing these parallels, but, um, Nobody owes her anything. That's basically what are is told to, uh, in a lot of ways, us dudes. And nobody owes me anything. And you know what? For the most part, I kind of agree. I don't think any one individual owes me shit. Um, unless you have like some sort of legal contract or something like that. However, you can make the argument that we all do we all do owe each other to some degree things common decency, um, uh, not, you know, playing favorites, especially with something like a legal system. I mean, we already know physically attractive people get, especially in this case, especially younger women, but younger white women, especially too. Uh, but physically attractive people in general get softer sentences. I wonder why. And, you know, if nobody owes me anything, it's like nobody owes a fair legal system. That would be a disaster. We already don't really have a fair legal system, but it could be way worse. It could be way worse. Um, and so I'm a firm believer that the phrase, nobody owes you anything is so selectively enforced and is so hypocritically used that if you ever, the vast majority, I don't think I've ever met a person who says that thing, that phrase and doesn't make and isn't some of the most like like mean spirited, self centered people you'll ever meet. Um, their problems are all these. Everyone needs to, everyone in the friend group needs. To, I know two people who have said one a male, one a female. They they both use that phrase. Nobody owes you anything all the time, and then they have these insane um, issues personally that they dump onto the rest of the friend group and expect us to kind of stop what we're doing and give them what they need and. It's like, nobody owes you anything, buddy. Um, you see it politically. I mean, you know, I know people, um, you know, you, you go survey, you go up to these places, like, uh, like I always use Northern Kentucky as an example, cause it's very red state. And, you know, these, these people are very red state, very laissez faire capitalism to some degree. And then they'll sit here and say, I feel like I'm being left behind. And it's like, which by the way, that's the same kind of mentality that the lesbian girl who wrote that article said it basically was feeling I feel like I'm being erased I'm being left behind nobody owes you anything 
So the question is, how much of society, how much do we owe people things? And it seems like to me that 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 sort of contract, that sort of trust into humanity or in in the country or in, in the world seems to be eroding. And I think it's because people don't really socialize and get to know others that much anymore. People have, I, I think most people's ability to sympathize with others has greatly diminished in the past 10 to 15, maybe almost 20 years now, definitely since the social media age took off sometime around 07, 08, due to, people always say like, I hate when people think the financial collapse was as important as the social media age that basically happened at right around the same time. Um, I guess most people say the oh, the financial collapse started in 08. It really started in 07 if you look at some of the earliest bankruptcies. Now, of course, the stock market collapse wasn't until 08, but but a lot of the uh, a lot of these companies that were already, you know, letting go and laying off, especially investment banks and whatnot, they were already letting people employees go and and the 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 writing was starting to see uh, hit the wall or whatever. But 07 and 08 is, is, I mean, the financial collapse was obviously big that people still maybe haven't fully recovered from. However, I maintain the entire, the main issue was Steve Jobs introducing the iPhone around that time, which isn't the first smartphone in the sense that it wasn't the first time the phrase was ever used. That I mean, I believe the IBM Simon was the first smartphone and that was 1994 or some shit. I remember reading, uh, doing like an essay on that shit way back in college. But, um, but the, but, but the, but if you ask a thousand people what the first smartphone is, they're probably going to say the iPhone one. So it's almost one of those perception is reality type things where if everybody thinks the first smartphone, uh, was the iPhone, does that in fact make it the first smartphone? And, um, the point is, is that, um, that time period, since that time period took off, I think social media jealousy is the number one cause of all the world's problems. It's not the only cause and, and, you know, maybe all of the other problems are, uh, bigger as a whole, but if there is one particular issue I see, it is social media obsession. And I I think it's hurting a lot of women more than men right now, but, uh, because I think women, um, are, I I know two women who, uh, can't put their phones down with Instagram and basically act like children when they're not near their phone. And these are grown ass women in their late thirties. I want to say they're a little bit older than me. That's insane to act that way just because you're not near your phone. And like, it's like they they start to like have anxiety because they're not near their phone. I, I think that would be fucked up if you're, you know, a middle schooler or a high schooler doing that shit. These were, these were grown ass women in their late thirties. That's insane. Which by the way, you know, that's a millennial and millennials in a way still feel like the young buck generation. I'm a millennial, a little bit on the younger side, but, uh, you know, born in the early nineties, but, but, um, but the point is, is that, uh, the millennials still kind of feel like the baby generation. Cause I don't, I don't know. There's not a lot of zoomers. I, th- I see a fewer and fewer. Uh, I start to, you know, I, I empathize with Gen Z a lot. I, I almost feel like an honorary member in some ways because of how my life went uh, seems to be similar to theirs, but, but, uh, I'm, I'm just ahead of the curve with how much my life sucks. No, I think that, uh, people spend too much time on the internet and I think people's ability to sympathize with others has greatly diminished because of it. Hence the phrase, nobody owes you anything becoming a rebuttal to almost every, a, a lots and things people say. In fact, I know, I mean, first of all, the, the internet age didn't invent that phrase. Obviously nobody owes you anything. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's a quote attributed to a, an author I, I, I really like. I actually am a big fan of Mark Twain, but I'm pretty sure there's actually a semi-famous quote by Mark Twain that involves that phrase, nobody owes anything, and that kind of hurts because I, I actually like a lot of his works. Um, I'm a big fan of The Mysterious Stranger. Um, you know, everyone, a lot of people read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn back in the day. Uh, those are fun little adventure stories. I, I don't think they're super amazing or anything, but uh, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was also an entertaining read. But yeah, The Mysterious Stranger I thought was really somewhat nihilistic and fucked up. But um, but I thought it was at least a really interesting read and story. 
But anyway, yeah, nobody owes you anything. If, if again, uh, you can if you listen to people say this and you hear people from all walks of life say nobody owes you anything. And um it almost always can be reflected back into their face that you know that you're basically saying you're a hypocrite. For example, conservatives will say we need a Jesus inspired God God fearing country, Christian nations, bullshit. I mean, uh, you know, some, you know, there's also a lot of younger right wingers who have kind of moved on from religious right. I think they're more Andrew Tatian right or some shit. But I know a lot of Christian right wingers who think we need to have Jesus everywhere. And it's like, nobody owes you anything. Shut the fuck up. Nobody owes you a God fearing Christian country. Live by your own principle of nobody owes you anything. So that's an example of right wingers doing it. And then you have the left wing. Where you'll see, and again, I, I, again, a large chunk of it I see is the problem is the men are too conservative and the women are too liberal. But a lot of younger women will act like we need to have a Planned Parenthood. And that nobody owes you a Planned Parenthood. Nobody owes you anything. Planned Parenthood is funded by, well, it was, I'm, 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 from what I understand, it's been defunded. But it's, it's funded by taxpayers, by you and me, or even, I mean, hey. Jeff Bezos, I know everyone everyone on the left hates CEOs and, and corporate, you know, corporate dr- fucks like them. I'm not even, I'm not a big fan of them myself. I think they're under taxed and I will, I will side with the left there. But, you know, to live by that principle of nobody owes anything, well, Jeff Bezos doesn't owe you anything. Elon Musk doesn't owe you anything. Um, and so these people would immediately dis- disagree with that as soon as I would bring it up to their face. And you see it all the time with, with how people act. They say nobody owes you anything, but they really are quick to make demands for people to do sh- the shit that they want. When in reality, if you truly believe nobody owes you anything, you wouldn't really have many political opinions to begin with. You would let the chips fall the way that they fall whatever, in the voting booth. Hell, nobody owes you a fair voting booth if they want to... F- Cast extra ballots. Yeah, well, nobody. If you got away with it, you got away with it. Nobody owes you anything. And you know that's a little bit of a logical extreme, but the but the premise still stands. Nobody owes you anything is bullshit. We do owe each other to some degree, respect, tolerance, um, being willing to listen, being willing to accept that we. You know, I would argue being friends with people, even if you don't agree with them on fucking everything. That's, I think, something we owe each other. Being willing to at least be a friend to somebody, even if you don't completely owe, even if you don't completely agree with them. So yeah, I hate that phrase. Nobody owes you anything, and it's such a stupid rebuttal. It's such a, you know. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is, whenever somebody says that, I mean. Basically, I think at the end of the day, it's code for, I don't want to talk about this issue that's on your mind, but you, but you're going to talk about the issue that I have on my mind. So yeah, please, if anybody ever in a discussion ever brings that up to you again, try not, you know, don't be rude unless they're being rude to you. But if you're ever in some sort of discussion politically, whatever about anything, uh, politics and religion and all that other shit. If they, if they say that phrase, make sure you hold them to it themselves. You hold them to it also, I should say. Anyway, have a good rest of your evening and stay. Try to find people that actually like to do stuff and are semi-happy campers. Just my thoughts and amount.